most powerful shortwave transmitter in North America, the CBC's new station at Sackville, New Brunswick, officially opens. Beamed to Europe, the programs are designed chiefly for Canada's fighting forces. From its complex million-dollar transmitting plants, the Canadian point of view is placed before friendly European peoples. From the International Service Studios in Montreal, the people of Germany are given the grim facts of their situation. The voice of Canada, loud and strong, takes the air. This is Canada calling. Ladies and gentlemen, the Prime Minister of Canada. This evening marks the formal opening of Canada's International Broadcasting Service. I should like the first words spoken officially to be words of greeting to Canada's armed forces serving on and beyond the seas. As we undertake this new service, let us resolve that in peace as in war, we will be true to the ideals you are so valiantly upholding. Mobile army stations on the continent relay the programs to forward troops on frequencies which they can receive. Everywhere in the lands of Europe, friend and foe alike are listening to Canada on the air. Yes, it's that familiar signature, the West, the Nest, and you, bringing with it a touch of home to our fighting sons and daughters, wherever they may be. Featured with the orchestra are the trio of three of a kind. And who knows someday may be Art Hallman. Our dreams will all come true. Norma Locke. A sweet land of busy. And the quartet. Canadian ports sail the convoys which are the lifeline of the army in the field. Now it can be told how merchant ships converted to pygmy aircraft carriers have helped keep it intact. Loaded with 7,000 tons of Canadian wheat, the flat tops combine the function of a secret weapon with those of an ordinary cargo carrier. Navy flyers, protecting the convoy from submarines, have only 100 feet in which to land their planes. All precautions are taken as the landing on a dime operations get underway. British flyers take hair-raising chances every time they come in to land. On their missions, they spot enemy U-boats and blast them with depth charges. Streamlined watchdogs of the convoys, they are largely responsible for keeping the subs down where they belong. Only 380 feet long, the carriers evade enemy reconnaissance. Great credit for victory in the Atlantic goes to the baby flat top. Canadian troops of Jewish persuasion march to a special service. It is the first Jewish church parade to be held on German soil since its capture. Men from all parts of the Dominion gather to worship. The service is conducted by Padre Samuel Cass of Montreal and Vancouver. Only one and one half percent of the Dominion's population is Jewish. There are upwards of 10,000 Jews in the Canadian army alone. Girls of the CWAC in the Western War Theater prepare for their first blighty leave. Being a woman in this man's war does have its compensations. The journey by lorry is only the preliminary to the hop across the channel. No long trip by train and boat. Canadian girls on BLA leave travel the Dakota way. No mere man minds a bit. The lassies are doing a bang up job on all fronts. Here's to us. 
happy nine days. At an aero pip school in southern England, the eyes of artillery receive their wings. Air Commodore Russell of the RAF presides at the ceremony. A tough six-month course trains gunner officers to fly their own artillery spotting planes. Those who qualify receive a captaincy with their wings. As one class graduates, another marches in to commence training. Target Wilhelmstrasse will soon be pinpointed by the officers of the Air OPIP. In the Reichwald forest of what was once Hitler's Germany, signs of the times are seen. The eighth victory loan is heralded by a buzz of activity from the sign painters. The material they use all comes from German stores. Canadian art with Jerry Paint convinces the boys that it's smart to invest in the best. From Supreme Headquarters AEF comes the signal to attack across the Rhine. Canadian troops at the left of the line, loaded on amphibious vehicles, leave the starting point. The great drive is on. Following on the heels of air annihilation, forward spearheads cross the river with very little resistance from the enemy. Soon a mass of troops pour across on every available conveyance. The first of the Canadians to go ashore are men of the Highland Light Infantry of Gulf and Kitchener. The war of movement starts with a vengeance. As the attack gets underway, at an airfield in England, men of the 1st Canadian Parachute Regiment in plane. They join their British buddies of the 6th Airborne Division and their cousins of the 17th U.S. Airborne Div in the mightiest air invasion in history. Veterans of D-Day fly to the grand assault. The Canucks plunge to earth with the assault wave. The landing is made near the woods opposite Zanton, some miles east of the Rhine. Heavy mortar fire from tough Jerry paratroopers greets them. Positions are consolidated at the bayonet point as the airborne deluge continues. Medical orderlies treat the wounded on the spot. Soon gliders are bringing in transport and artillery to reinforce the drive. Within three and a half hours of the original landing, all objectives are taken. Still, reinforcements and material pour down from the skies. or Schutzstaffel, they all look the same when the smoke clears. Hitler's henchmen have bogged down in their own last ditch. A carrier patrol of the Royal Scots links up with Canadian paratroops in an historic meeting. With infantry and airborne consolidated, the Allied avalanche rolls steadily ahead. Within 48 hours of initial crossings, pontoon bridges span the Rhine. Troops and heavy equipment surge over to catch up with the advance. First objective is the important enemy control point of Emmerich. A tank barrage supports the move. In Emmerich, elements of the 3rd Canadian Div mop up the stricken town. The enemy dies hard and counterattacks are frequent. As many as seven counterthrusts in as many hours are held, and the Allied grindstone leaves the chaff in its wake. With Emmerich in our hands, the going is easier. The communication center of Kessfeldt is taken after an artillery bombardment. Its railway junction lies in ruins. 
Its road signs point to the town of Münster, invested by General Dempsey. The fat of Europe has been wiped from Jerry's chin with the snowy serviettes now pointing out the gluttons who must pay the bill.